Each of them was someone's pride and joy, with hopes and dreams as invincible as steel. But this is the story of a nightmare. Can an accident expert figure out what caused the crash and who was driving? Enter the world of forensic science, the science of crime, where a suspect's guilt or innocence can hang on a single piece of evidence. feel that they are invincible. They don't know that the next day, the next hour, the next second, something could happen that could radically change their lives. This is the story of someone who suddenly woke up in a nightmare. They had all graduated from high school the summer before. It was a going away party for two friends off for a six month backpack halfway around the world. But it was really a goodbye party for all of them. Around 11, Sarah LeBeau and her friend arrived in Sarah's new car. The party was already in full swing, a hundred strong, including parents and neighbors. But for them, it was just the gang, the high school buds. Even Neil Atchison was there. Neil was a local small town Ontario boy who amazingly had been drafted to play baseball by the Los Angeles Dodgers. He had come home just for the party. They were going to be friends forever it would be a night to remember, but not in the way any of them expected. <laughs> By five in the morning, the party had dwindled down to just them. They didn't want the party to end. Who knew when they would be together again? So someone suggested they go to a nearby house for breakfast. Even Sarah, who had to go to work in a few hours, was up for it. It was just a short five minute drive away, down a highway they'd driven hundreds of times before. Sarah's friend was in the lead car. Sarah's car followed. But somewhere down the road, she lost sight of Sarah's car. When Sarah's car didn't pull in for breakfast, her friend went back to see if anything had happened. When she saw the shattered cedar guidepost, her heart started to race. What she was about to find was something she will never forget, nor would the small community she lived in. officers arrived uh, approximately 10 to 15 minutes after the accident took place, um, the driver of the car wasn't still behind the wheel, sitting in the driver's seat. In this case, it was a single vehicle accident. All six occupants of the car were either unconscious or deceased. 
so we had no one to tell us who was driving. The living are rushed to the hospital, but the final tally from this accident would be four dead. We have four young people from, uh, from the community, you know, who are all well known, um, that uh, have died in the accident. Two are seriously hurt, they were well known as well. Um, yeah, it has an impact uh, on, on the surrounding community. Um, so yes, it becomes very high profile almost immediately. I think that's an interesting thing. This one piece will make 52 layers. Watch on mobile devices or the big screen. All for free. No subscription required. It will fall to Steve Beasley and Rob Kern to begin investigating the question as to what caused the crash and who was driving. To be able to answer all of the questions that are going to come to us, these are the questions that are going to be asked of us later on. You know, why did my child die in this accident? How were they killed? Um, what happened to uh, cause this? Was this a, a problem with the engineering of the road? Was this a problem with the car? Was this a problem with the driver? You know, all of these things need to be uh, addressed. The first person interviewed is Sarah's friend. She tells the officer that the two cars had left one after the other. When Sarah's car didn't show up for breakfast, she went back. That's when she'd come across the horrendous tragedy. When the officer asked if there had been drinking at the party, she says yes, but by the time they left in the morning, pretty much everyone had sobered up. Now comes the key question. Was Sarah driving when they left? Her friend cannot say she did not see. Everybody was already piled into Sarah's car by the time she tried to get in. But she basically makes one thing clear. Sarah was not the kind of person to drive when she was drunk. So the investigators know the wrecked car belonged to Sarah but not who was driving. They know there had been drinking at the party, but not whether alcohol was a factor in the crash. They need answers before they know whether criminal charges are warranted and against whom. If investigators hope the two survivors can help fill in the details, they will be disappointed. One of them had been so drunk he passed out before he even got into the car. And the other survivor, Sarah LeBeau, is in hospital fighting for her life. In the absence of an eyewitness, it will be up to forensic science to come up with some answers, such as the speed of the car. The first thing I noticed when I arrived on the scene was a set of marks up on the roadway that were long and shallow. And uh, you know, I realized that these are yaw marks. They're not skid marks. They're not made from a braking tire. What they're made from is a car trying to negotiate a curve. The tires are still rolling during this time frame. The tire is rolling, but it's also side slipping. And the car begins to go into that type of attitude. And what will happen is, uh, if the car is left to go, if, if nothing happens to the car within that, it may eventually end up into a four-wheel slide. Yaw marks suggest the car was speeding. Combined with the booze found in the smashed up car and the drinking at the party, these might be grounds for criminal charges. More than ever, the key question is, who was driving? Fortunately, the first two officers at the scene noted in their, their notebooks and actually made drawings in their notebooks of the position of each of the six occupants. And in their notes, they showed a female occupant with her feet in the floor pan area and her lower legs in the floor pan area of the car, and she was partially ejected out onto the um, grass below the car. That female is Sarah LeBeau, and it is her car. So investigators suspect that Sarah LeBeau had been the driver. Having survived the first of a series of life-threatening operations, Sarah LeBeau awakens to a living nightmare. 
She's suspected of having killed four of her friends and intensifying the nightmare, she has no memory of any part of the ride. Meanwhile, accident reconstructionist Rob Kern and investigator Steve Beasley are trying to build a case against Sarah. It is one thing to suspect that Sarah is guilty, but another to build a case beyond a reasonable doubt against her. From the yaw marks at the scene, Rob Kern can tell that Sarah's car had been speeding when it left the road. But exactly how fast was it going? A drag sled is used to establish the road's friction coefficient. When this number is plugged into the mathematical formula for calculating speed, the result is telling. What we've established using this measurement is at the point where that car begins to side slip, you know, at the beginning of that yaw, that uh, we believe that the car was doing um, approximately 152 kilometers an hour. And given that the speed limit is 90 kilometers an hour in that zone, um, you know, we're looking at uh, 62 kilometers an hour over the speed limit. Having calculated the speed, the scientist can now determine what happened to the car in its last moments. So we figure the car comes around, it is basically out of control as it's going into yaw, leaves the roadway, travels along the embankment, through the, uh, the cedar guideposts, traverses the embankment, strikes the, uh, the perpendicular embankment, vaults, lands, rolls over once. While Rob Curran uses science to get a picture of what happened, lead investigator Steve Beasley finds a witness who can identify who was driving Sarah's car when it left the party. I spoke with a, a young man who uh, had been at the party at the Hill Farm, and he was one of the last to leave. He actually spoke to the occupants in the LeBeau car prior to it leaving. He'd uh, looked in the window, and he actually saw Sarah LeBeau behind the wheel of the car, and he saw the car drive away from the farm. Sarah is slowly recovering physically, but she still has no memory of the crash in which her leg was badly crushed and her foot nearly severed. But her injuries are of interest to investigators. What interested us the most was the speed, and also that impact with the embankment. Um, this is a very, very significant impact because it uh, crushes up the whole left front of the car, the undercarriage, and moves it back in towards the driver foot well area. Well, Sarah LeBeau was the only one with that significant lower extremity injury. Now the investigators need to factor in the question of alcohol. A blood sample taken from Sarah shortly after the accident had been sent to the Center of Forensic Sciences for testing. It comes back indicating Sarah's blood alcohol content was 0.144, nearly twice the legal limit. So Sarah was legally impaired as well as speeding. As soon as Sarah is out of medical danger, she is charged with the deaths of her friends, 11 counts, including four counts of causing death by criminal negligence and of impaired driving causing death. The facts supported charges being laid against her. I mean, it's a tragedy. Uh, she herself suffered tremendous injuries, but you know, the system of justice that we're in requires uh, where charges be grounded in facts like we had them, charges ought to be laid. The case against Sarah LeBeau seems conclusive, but the lawyer the LeBeau family hires checks everything. Though accident reconstruction is based on reams of data, it is not an exact science. Could investigators have misinterpreted or overlooked a key clue? That's when Sarah's defense seizes on the driver's airbag. This is 1995, and airbags are still relatively new. None of the investigators had thought to check them out. Exhibit A, blood stains on a driver's airbag. 
Could they determine who had been driving Sarah's car when it crashed? Defense sends the driver's airbag to an independent lab. The lab confirms that there are bloodstains on the airbag, none of which are Sarah's. The defense uh, was hoping to establish that she wasn't the driver by using the airbag. And the defense uh, wanted to establish that someone else's blood was on the airbag because the analysis of the blood on the airbag did not reveal Sarah LeBeau's blood. So I think uh, the defense position was, well, if it wasn't her blood, then she's not the driver. Defense also points out that a boot belonging to Neil Atchison was found near the crushed driver's footwell. Neil's body had been found close to Sarah's. Sarah had been seen at the wheel leaving the party. But Sarah claims that on more than one occasion, Neil had asked if he could drive Sarah's car. Was it possible that there had been a switch and that Neil was driving when the car crashed? Sarah has been identified as the driver of the fatal car. But why aren't any of the blood spatters on the driver's side airbag hers? And why was a boot belonging to Neil Atchison found near the driver's footwell? Is it possible that someone else was driving Sarah's car when it went off the road? Shortly before the case comes to trial, and almost three years after the crash, Sarah's lawyer gets her to take part in a staged reenactment of the fatal drive in an effort to recover her memory. She later testifies that a few images came flooding back to her. She sort of remembered being in the driver's seat. And she sort of remembered the car stopping. Neil Atchison getting in behind the wheel. Is Sarah's recovered memory a desperate attempt to avoid a jail sentence? Is her mind playing tricks to avoid facing the truth that she is responsible for killing four of her friends? Well, originally uh, her position was that she just couldn't remember what happened. And that memory, uh, or that position was maintained for a long time. After that reenactment, uh, apparently this memory emerged where she recalled uh, switching seats with Neil Atchison, who our belief was the center front passenger. What weight can you give that kind of evidence where you have a memory emerge after a reenactment? But Sarah's lawyer doesn't have to prove who was driving the car. All he has to do is raise a reasonable doubt that Sarah was not behind the wheel when the car crashed. The question, the center question, uh, to be answered uh, was Ms. LeBeau seated in the driver's seat time of the crash. That had to be answered. And it was basically left to us to ascertain what was on this bag that might assist the police the investigators, the court, ultimately. What's the truth in this matter? Was she seated there or not? Keith Kelder tests the bloodstains. They haven't come from Sarah, but they also haven't come from Neil, and no one else has ever been suggested as the driver. Then I decided, as I decided on very early in this investigation, to test for saliva. I reasoned that there may be a very good possibility that whoever was driving during that horrific crash and that solid impact with the bag, that saliva would be deposited on this bag. Within 20 minutes, the test paper turns blue, confirming the presence of amylase, a key ingredient in saliva. The DNA is consistent with that of Sarah LeBeau. But Sarah's lawyer argues that the saliva test doesn't prove anything. He suggests that the saliva was simply projected onto the airbag during the accident. 
but the airbag has not yet revealed all its secrets. It is passed on to forensic chemist Brenda Burton. There were three basic areas that I looked at and analyzed. There was the black deposits or smears. There were some pinkish colored smears around one of the black areas that I analyzed, as well as um, some of the other, there was a larger pinkish colored smear down below those deposits that were analyzed as well. She suspects that the black material is mascara and possibly eyeliner. So she compares the smears to her cosmetic samples. What uh, emerged from that analysis was not only, you know, the presence of saliva and blood, but these cosmetic marks, almost in the fashion of two eyebrows that were seen on the airbag. And at the, uh, the bottom of the triangle was some saliva where the DNA matched Sarah. So it was almost as if her face was imprinted in the airbag. Tests show Sarah LeBeau was legally impaired, having a blood alcohol content twice the legal limit. Sarah LeBeau was behind the wheel when her car left the party, and she did not switch places with Neil Atchison <laughs> or anyone else. In a 90-kilometer zone, Sarah LeBeau's car was speeding at approximately 150 kilometers an hour when it missed the curve and crashed. In the end, the airbag that saved Sarah's life also led to her conviction. Sarah LeBeau was found guilty on all counts of causing death by criminal negligence and of impaired driving causing death. She was sentenced to four years in prison. Though the imprint of her face was found on the airbag, Sarah could not accept the verdict. She is currently appealing her conviction. Sarah's conviction divided the community. Some felt she had suffered enough, but others couldn't forgive her for trying to blame a dead friend and not accepting full responsibility for getting behind the wheel. A young woman is found raped and strangled. Who's the killer? Is it the man who wore the Paisley shirt? Is it the man who stole the bicycle? Or is it the man who fits the DNA profile? Enter the world of forensic science, the science of crime, where a suspect's guilt or innocence can hang on a single piece of evidence. People feel safe living in uh, close-knit communities. They know their neighbors, and they can leave their doors unlocked. And they can walk home at night alone. Random violence can only happen somewhere else. It couldn't happen here. Or could it? August 7th, 1997, North Bay, Ontario. 20-year-old Sarah Whitehead and her father are getting ready for her mother's birthday, which is tomorrow. Sarah has forgotten to buy a birthday card. So at 6.30 p.m., she sets out for the nearby mall.
Sarah is expected home by eight. She doesn't turn up. It's so unlike her. As darkness falls, her worried parents telephone Sarah's friends, but no one has heard from her. By midnight, the Whiteheads are desperate. They call police. Detective Tim Nesbitt of the North Bay Police recalls what happened next. They start looking for her themselves, uh, checking an area. There's a pathway between the mall and the residential area that used to be a roadway. And they couldn't find her. The following morning, her uncle gets involved uh, and assists with searching for Sarah. And he's walking the roadway and sees a Walkman on the side of the roadway. It was kind of in the grass a little bit. And there's several paths off this roadway, and he takes one path and oh, maybe 60 to 70 feet off the roadway, he sees Sarah's lifeless body. One of the first officers to arrive at the crime scene is IDENT officer Marty Ransom. She was only semi-clothed. She had on clothing which was consistent with uh, having gone for a jog or a walk. And uh, she was carrying some personal items with her that were with the body. Sarah Whitehead has been brutally raped and murdered. The marks on her neck suggest that she was strangled, possibly with the killer's bare hands. None of her many friends and relatives can imagine why anyone would do this to Sarah. She was just a nice young woman with plans to go to business school. She had no enemies. Detectives start to piece together Sarah's movements on the evening of the murder. A bit of a fitness buff, Sarah had walked to the mall, taking a neighborhood shortcut. When she got there, Sarah talked to some friends and did a bit of shopping. She was last seen leaving the mall sometime between 7.50 and 8 p.m., walking back towards the shortcut. Investigators quickly rule out robbery as a motive. The attacker has left Sarah's money, her Walkman, and her jewelry. But something was taken from the victim. After doing an inventory of the clothing which we believe she was wearing that day, we uh, found that she uh, was not wearing a pair of uh, beige-colored shorts. A short distance down the road from the mall, a worker stumbles across some clothes that weren't there the previous day. IDENT officers are so busy at the crime scene that it is several hours before they respond. When they arrive, what they find instead of Sarah's shorts are a pair of jeans and a rather unusual looking Paisley shirt. Hoping that these have something to do with Sarah's murder, Officers take the clothes to the forensic lab for examination. At the crime scene, 20 acres have been cordoned off, and IDENT officers meticulously collect pop cans, soil samples, cigarette butts, whatever they can find. A few hundred yards from her body, Sarah's shorts are finally found, carefully folded and hidden under a rock. Why would the killer have done such a thing? Puzzled investigators send the shorts to the center of forensic sciences. One thing is clear to investigators. This will not be an easy murder to solve. To catch the killer, they will need every resource available to them, and they'll need to act quickly. Looking for some insight into the killer's character, they ask behavioral profiler Jim Van Allen to take a look at the crime scene. The open nature of where the actual assault occurred suggested a high-risk crime to the offender. High risk in that there was a very good chance somebody would have happened past, seen him, heard something, identified him, or interrupted the crime in some way. This suggested that we were dealing with a very impulsive type of offender committing a very spontaneous type of crime. Van Allen finds a trampled area on the side of the path. He believes that this is where the killer stood waiting for his victim. 
it's quite possible that being unescorted and having the Walkman on facilitated the criminal to get closer to her. The nature of this particular crime suggested that it was a very angry impulse. It was very cold and brutal, but not an overexpressing of, of emotional violence. Van Allen speculates that the crime was a release of anger that had been building in the killer, the result of a trauma of some sort, a job loss or a fight with a loved one, perhaps. Van Allen believes the killer is a white male between the ages of 17 and 25. We figured that he would have some familiarity with North Bay, speculated that he might live there and relatively close to the uh, crime scene. Probably have a history of some deviant crime, violence against women, uh, possibly stalking. Investigators question Van Allen about the killer's relationship to his victim. In my opinion, this would have been a stranger to the victim. A stranger to the victim. Van Allen confirms the community's worst fears, that someone in North Bay is capable of killing at random. Is he waiting for his next victim? The murder of 20-year-old Sarah Whitehead has rocked the small city of North Bay. There was a, a tidal wave went through this community in regards to this crime. People were nervous. People were afraid to go out and start walking, at night especially. Along with the fear, there is grief. Yellow ribbons appear in tribute to the young woman so many mourn. In the days following the crime, the pathologist's report confirms what police had suspected. Sarah died as a result of manual strangulation. Although she was raped, no semen was found on the body. But there is a semen stain on Sarah's beige shorts. Biologist Jonathan Newman at the forensic lab explains. We tested the, the semen on the shorts and developed a DNA profile. It wasn't a full DNA profile. It's what we, we describe as a partial DNA profile. Some of the information was missing because of the limited amount of sample. Going through the files of known sex offenders, recent parolees, and psychiatric patients, investigators are developing quite a list of suspects. They know that even a partial DNA profile will help them zero in on Sarah's killer. Tests are conducted on the jeans and Paisley shirt that were found not far from the mall. Jonathan Newman finds a semen stain on the inside fly of the jeans, and the DNA profile of that semen stain matches the one on Sarah's shorts. Not only that, but in that uh, semen stain, there was in fact a mixture of both this uh, semen DNA profile and a DNA profile from the victim. So we had a mixture of the victim plus uh, what we believe to be the perpetrator. That can only mean that the clothes belong to the killer. Exhibit A, the clothes of a killer. A medium-sized paisley shirt and a pair of jeans with a 32-inch waist and a 27 and a half inch inseam. This was a large break in the case. The measurements of the pants, we were able to get a physical description of this individual, at least a stature, the size. Police now know that they are looking for a man of about 150 to 160 pounds, approximately five foot seven inches in height. But the other details of his appearance remain a mystery. Two months have passed since Sarah's killing, and still no arrest has been made. Investigators turn to the public for help. They hope that the Paisley shirt will jog someone's memory. The investigators keep Sarah's parents informed about their progress. The 
They tell them that the community is calling in tips about people acting strangely or wearing Paisley shirts. The Whiteheads appreciate the respect that the detective showed them, the concern they show for Sarah's memory, and the long hours they work investigating suspect after suspect. We would go and talk to the individual. We would ask for a consent sample for DNA analysis. If they fit the clothing, we would send the sample down. If they didn't fit the clothing, uh, we weren't uh, dealing with that person any further. After considering dozens of suspects, 50-year-old Buddy Campbell stands out. This one individual refused to give us a sample, so he went into a different category. He fit the clothing and fit the profile to a certain extent. Hoping for a sample of DNA from Campbell's saliva, investigators collect a discarded pop can. They send it to the Center of Forensic Sciences. Biologist Jonathan Newman does the analysis. He is able to create a DNA profile from the saliva on the pop can. He compares it to the DNA found on the blue jeans, the perpetrator's DNA. 50 people have been cleared, and then we had the first hit, or the first match. The quad system test shows that Campbell's DNA matches the killer's DNA at four random locations. It also reveals how common the profile is. And it occurred with an expected frequency of about one person in every 3,000. Buddy Campbell is one in 3,000. After coming up cold so many times, investigators finally have a viable suspect. And the closer they look at Campbell, the more likely it seems they've got their man. We were able to put this individual in the mall at 6 p.m. on the date of the murder. We had people telling us they saw him with this shirt on. His stature was right on. Several women had accused the suspect of stalking, a crime Van Allen had mentioned in his behavioral profile. There was another aspect of Van Allen's profile that seemed to fit nicely, the idea of a traumatic event which may have triggered the crime. In Buddy Campbell's case, this might have been a recent split up with his wife and the loss of custody of his children. And Detective Nesbitt discovers something else. The day after uh, the murder, uh, he uh, dyed his hair uh, and left for Southern Ontario in a taxi. So some things were pointing quite strong in, in, strongly in, in his direction. So strongly, in fact, that Buddy Campbell is arrested and charged with the first-degree murder of Sarah Whitehead. We've got so much of just old-fashioned police work that pointed towards this individual. And his actions were causing the investigation to further and develop. The DNA was a bonus. Jonathan Newman hopes to strengthen that aspect of the case. He asks his supervisors for permission to use a brand new form of DNA testing just being introduced to the CFS. At that time in 1997, we had just validated a brand new uh, DNA testing system called Profiler. Rather than looking at four locations within the DNA, this system looks at nine locations within the DNA. So we did that analysis. And in fact, the result of the analysis was that we excluded this individual as a potential donor of this semen. Now, wait a second. Not Buddy Campbell? The results come as a shock to Detective Nesbitt and his team in North Bay. There's a tremendous feeling of uncertainty as to how could this be wrong? How can so much point towards an individual? And uh, here we are with the wrong guy. But somebody was on the shortcut behind the mall that night. Somebody grabbed Sarah Whitehead, raped her, and strangled her. The question for Detective Nesbitt is who? Still reeling from the news that DNA tests have excluded their prime suspect, 
detectives pay a visit to Sarah's parents. After six months, the investigation is back to square one. The detectives worry that the Whiteheads may have lost confidence in them. They offer to turn the case over to others. The Whiteheads talk it over. After so long, a bond has developed. They know these officers. They believe in them. The Whiteheads want them to continue. Over the following year, Nesbitt's team identifies hundreds of additional suspects. 258 DNA samples are forwarded to the Center of Forensic Sciences, but the killer remains at large. Then, just down the highway from North Bay, investigators get some unexpected news. Constable Christopher Brown of the Ontario Provincial Police receives a fax from a prison administrator in Western Canada about a man named Paul Hashi. He asks Brown to check on the status of an outstanding warrant for the arrest of this Paul Hashi on a theft charge in the North Bay area. Brown discovers that the warrant is still on file. Hashi has stolen a bicycle from his sister in the summer of 1997. She had filed a police report, but police were unable to find him. Brown calls the prison administrator back. They uh, told me that he was in custody for uh, an aggravated sexual assault from Western Canada. When I looked at the warrant that was on file and the time frame, it fit in with when this murder occurred, and that kind of clicked to me that um, it was the circumstances of that uh, offense at West were uh, somewhat similar or the, this individual would be capable of something like this is what occurred in, in North Bay. Paul Hashi becomes suspect number 712. Police discover similarities between Sarah Whitehead's murder and the rape Hashi committed out West. Both victims were in their 20s. Both victims were strangled manually. Both were left in their shirt and bra while the pants and underwear were removed. And 32-year-old Paul Hashi is a perfect fit for the jeans and shirt found in North Bay. An abuser of drugs and alcohol, Hashi had burned his bridges with most of his family. But he had managed to retain a relationship with his sister. But stealing her bike and selling it was the last straw for her. She was furious with him and threw him out. Van Allen thinks this event may have been pivotal for Hatchie. I speculated that in the preceding two to three weeks or a month leading up to the crime that there would have been some incident that the police can identify that would suggest that he's had a falling out with somebody who's been kicked out, evicted from somewhere, or an argument with a relative. I saw this as uh, suggesting that the offender um, was using the crime as an angry release. North Bay police are able to get Hashi's DNA sample from cigarette butts that had been collected out west by police after his sexual assault. Nesbitt anxiously awaits results of the DNA test done by Jonathan Newman. What we did was we took the cigarette butts from that crime scene and generated a DNA profile from the cigarette butt and compared that to our profiler, our nine locus DNA profile from the crime scene samples uh, in the North Bay case, and we got a match. And the frequency of occurrence of the profile was one in the approximate population of the world. So it was less common than one in six billion. Finally, 21 months after the investigation began, police have irrefutable DNA evidence. It is proof positive that Paul Hashi murdered Sarah Whitehead, a random act of violence. I think uh, the community lost big time. She was up and coming, an honor student, quiet, giving. She had a lot to offer, and uh, 
That was taken away. In court, Paul Hashi enters a plea of guilty and is convicted. He is sentenced to life in prison. The news is comforting to the people of North Bay, but the sense of security that they once knew will never be quite the same. Somewhere in the city, there is a walking time bomb. Stress upon stress is building inside him. It will explode in one desperate act. Can scientists and investigators sift through the debris and catch a mad bomber? Enter the world of forensic science, the science of crime, where a suspect's guilt or innocence can hang on a single piece of evidence. Explosion is difficult to investigate. There are many possible causes, many possible targets. When the only eyewitness is in a coma, it's even more complicated. It falls to detectives and forensic scientists to make sense of all the shattered bits and pieces. Rush hour in Toronto's financial district. Thousands of cars and people are packing the streets of the city. In an underground parking lot, a limousine chauffeur is startled by an explosion. A mail truck has blown up. The mail truck driver is engulfed in flames and is so traumatized that he actually tries to jump back into his burning vehicle. Miraculously, he is the only casualty. As an ambulance rushes him to the hospital, a bomb expert heads to the scene. On my way down there, I'm thinking, you know, it's a Canada Post truck. It's probably many packages in the back. Quite possibly one of these packages have detonated or exploded. I'm thinking at the time that possibly there might be secondary devices either within the truck or around the area. That was my primary concern. He scours the area using a special mirror device, but he detects no secondary explosive. Now the daunting task of trying to figure out what caused the explosion begins. Was it a bomb? If so, what kind? And especially, how was it detonated? You're looking for a power source because every time there's an explosive, you need a detonator to set the explosive off. Now to set that detonator off, you need a battery, you need uh, wires, um, and some kind of a switching device, whether it's a, uh, you know, a clock, a toggle switch, a pressure release switch. You're looking for the seat of the explosion. The mail truck driver is identified as Bruno Vitali. He's 38, a widowed father who lives with his daughter and his mother. He has severe burns over 90% of his body. His pain is almost lethal. Because of the injuries to the driver, homicide is called in. Who was the target of the explosion? And who is responsible for it? Is it the work of some fanatic as in Oklahoma City, or an act of international terrorism like the World Trade Center? Detectives discover that the office tower directly above the explosion houses numerous foreign embassies as well as hundreds of offices. Then something else grabs the investigator's attention. One of the offices in the tower belongs to a mining firm recently involved in a huge trading scandal. This was the week that Briex 
blew up and it's a Normandy and so many people suffered such fantastic losses there. Was this Brie X related? Was this someone, a shareholder, sending a message to someone, i.e. the big banks, or could have been a fanatic involved with sending a message to whatever audience he might have been targeting? The first person that detectives interview is the limo driver who saved Bruno Vitale. It turns out he is the chauffeur for the CEO of one of Canada's major banks, whose office was immediately above the bomb blast. Was he the target? The limo driver explains he was waiting downstairs for his boss when he noticed the mail truck driver talking to some delivery man. He remembers seeing the delivery man giving something to the mail truck driver and then drive away. The limo driver says he had just turned away when he heard the explosion and saw the burning man running out of the truck. That's when he'd rushed over to save him. Since this delivery man was the last known person to interact with the victim, police are anxious to locate him. As doctors fight to save Bruno Vitale's life, investigators encounter Bruno's daughter and his irate mother. She wanted the police to investigate, but she wanted to tell us how to do the investigation. She was going to tell us where we should look and where we shouldn't look. She tells them her son Bruno is their sole support. He works two full-time jobs as a postal driver and a delivery man. And he devotes all his spare time to coaching his daughter Sonia, a sprinter and budding Olympic hopeful. Bruno's mother says her son is a saint. He has no enemies, everyone loves him. She insists that detectives find out who did this to her son. In a search for more clues, Homicide checks out the security camera in the underground garage. You can see the billowing cloud starting to come out, and then you can see the postal worker actually entering the picture frame. His entire backside, from his scalp all the way down, had been incinerated. But because of the camera angle, the corner of the garage where the mail truck actually exploded is out of frame. As for the victim, his burns are so severe and his pain so intense, doctors try something rare. They put Bruno Vitale into an induced coma. As precious time ticks away, investigators wrestle with too many possibilities. Is this Briex related, embassy related, or the random act of a madman? What kind of bomb was it? And will there be more? An horrific explosion in a postal truck in a busy downtown underground garage has left the postal worker with such extensive burns that to save his life, doctors have put him into an induced coma. Still searching for clues as to how the explosion was detonated, a bomb expert examines how the postal truck buckled when the blast occurred. Meanwhile, detectives locate Wayne Ng, the delivery man who may have been the last person to talk with Bruno Vitelli prior to the explosion. When detectives question Ng, he is defensive. He keeps his answers short, making detectives work to get his story. Ng claims he hadn't even known there'd been an explosion till he'd heard it on the news. He insists he hardly knew Bruno. Bruno kept to himself. But on the day of the explosion, Bruno was acting differently, more talkative. According to Ng, Bruno proudly showed him how much mail he had already collected. 
When detectives ask Ng whether he gave Bruno anything, Ng answers, just a cigarette. He says he offered Bruno his lighter, but Bruno wanted matches. But Bruno's daughter says her father is an athlete and a confirmed non-smoker. He would never have asked anyone for a cigarette or a light. Is Ng telling the truth, or is he trying to mislead the police about his encounter with Bruno? I asked him if he would ever agree to go to a polygraph. Being the last person to see him, we'd like to rule him out. I got a call back the next day from a lawyer from this co-worker stating that he did not agree to going for a polygraph and he didn't want to be interviewed by the police anymore. The detective's suspicions are raised even more when a check into Ng's background reveals he has a previous weapons charge and a prison record. Meanwhile, the bomb expert has finished his preliminary investigation. So after looking for uh, different devices that possibly might have been used uh, regarding batteries, wires, detonators, explosives, uh, no containers at all that would uh, indicate a high explosive, determined that it was a gas, probably a gas vapor explosion. This supports the detective's finding. Though the truck is a diesel-powered vehicle, it could smell gasoline. At this point, the case is turned over to the fire inspector. When I arrived at the scene, I concurred with their finding, and I saw no evidence of cratering. The gaseous explosion is different from a hard explosion in that um, there's no definite seat. Um, the vapor ignites over an area, and so there's no cratering effect as a result. Every possible piece of evidence is put into bags and jars to be sent to the Center of Forensic Science for analysis. A gas explosion makes it more likely that this is the work of an amateur. That's when the case takes another amazing turn. The detective learns that the injured driver's daughter, Sonia, has recently been charged with second-degree murder. Sonia had been walking home from track practice with some friends when an argument suddenly turned violent. A girl was stabbed to death. A witness said they saw Sonia with a knife. Sonia was arrested and charged with second degree murder. Though she maintained her innocence, her case has yet to go to trial. About a month before the explosion, Bruno had a nasty run-in with the slain girl's uncle. Then early one morning, Sonia thought she heard a noise in the garage. Bruno checked it out. Nothing was missing but it really shook him that someone was possibly stalking them, looking for revenge. Detectives now add revenge as a possible motive. Meanwhile, fire inspector Linda Williams is working on the probable cause of the explosion in Bruno's truck. As I was going through the debris, systematically, piece by piece, piece of mail by piece of mail, I encountered an empty pop can, and I smelled it, and it smelled of a flammable liquid. An explosion occurs when the flammable liquid is within the explosive range. For gasoline, that's between roughly 1.4% and 7.6% volume mixed in air. When an ignition source is applied to that vapor the explosion happens very rapidly. Exhibit A, an ordinary pop can. Who could have placed it in the mail truck and why? Two and a half months have passed since a tragic explosion in his mail truck left driver Bruno Vitale in a coma. 
As his daughter tells the press, he slept through his 39th birthday, through Father's Day, and through the Olympic trials they had hoped to watch on TV together. Detectives are narrowing down the suspects. The delivery man, Wayne Ng, has been cleared. And so has the slain teenager's uncle. So detectives go back to ground zero. Then we go back to the last person in the vehicle when the explosion occurred. He can't talk to us, but certain injuries and what happened around him does start to speak for itself. And we have the other witnesses we relied upon. We couldn't rule out the driver as setting off this explosion by himself. The next clue comes from the fire inspector. She had submitted a normal-sized pop can for analysis, and it came back that there was gasoline in it. Based on that, police now suspect that the victim, now a potential suspect, probably had gas in the can and probably threw it on top of the mail inside and then ignited it with a match. But why would Bruno Vitale have set off an explosion in his own truck? More than ever, investigators want to talk to Bruno Vitale. But when Bruno finally regains consciousness, his mother vehemently refuses to let detectives talk to him. I'm sort of set back. My final person that was there at the explosion, who I believed and disbelieved at the same time that he was a victim, now has a lawyer on board, which is highly unusual for a victim, and the family will not let me talk to him. Bruno Vitelli, the victim, is now Bruno Vitelli, the prime suspect. Police wait until Bruno Vitelli is released from the hospital and sent home. Then they attempt to book him. We had seen pictures of him when he was in fine health. He was a very robust person. The person I saw looks almost collapsed into himself. He had a ball cap on, but you can just see the damage to his scalp and the skin. And he had these large, heavy industrial gloves on that were protecting where the skin rehabilitation was, was taking place. It was a very diminished person that we saw over here. Bruno Vitale is arrested and charged with two counts of arson to endanger life and to damage property, and one count of setting an explosive. But because Bruno has no criminal record and because of his injuries, he's released back to his family. Police do not consider him a threat. But shortly after, his mother calls police to say Bruno has disappeared. Meanwhile, fire expert Linda Williams has determined that Bruno is the only one who could have ignited the gasoline. The driver of the vehicle had to be there at the time of the ignition in order to be caught in the explosion and fire. Frequently, arsonists will um, spread gasoline around, wait for a little bit too long, ignite it, and get caught in the subsequent explosion and get burned, seriously burned as a result. Then one day, out of the blue, Bruno phones the detective. He has slipped into the United States, where he is gambling big time. Though his two jobs earned him $80,000 a year, he has never had enough money. And his daughter's trial is further draining him financially. Obsessed with getting rich fast, he has lost everything. He's depressed paranoid, and broke. Over the course of several phone calls and fearing that Bruno is now out of control, the detective persuades him to come back to Toronto and surrender. But on three separate occasions with the police on high alert, Bruno doesn't show up. Then one day, when the detective isn't expecting him, Bruno Vitale simply walks into the police station and gives himself up. Based on everything they can piece together, this is what investigators think happened. Bruno was a man whose main goal in life was to take care of his family. He worked two jobs, 
and devoted the rest of his time coaching his daughter, who dreamed of making it to the Olympics. But when his daughter was charged with second-degree murder, stress began to build inside him. The stress grew as daily he saw his daughter give up on her dreams. He was convinced that his daughter was innocent and was determined to spare no expense to prove it. But it was draining him financially. On top of that, he had a domineering mother who wouldn't let him sell his house to pay for his daughter's defense. He was terrified, terrified of seeing his family totally fall apart. So Bruno worked out a plan. He knew the Workplace Safety Insurance Act. He knew the union regulation about transporting hazardous materials. He counted on the insurance money to save his family. So he made sure there was a witness who knew his truck was full of mail. Then he asked for a cigarette and a match. He wanted to remove the external stressors on him and his family's life. He felt that he had to get the legal defense fund up. The insurance would have kicked in. The union would have grieved against the corporation for these hazardous materials. There would have been a major settlement. His family would have been taken care of and he wouldn't be subjected to all this enormous pressures and the changes he was going through. So when Bruno Vitale went back to his burning truck, he wasn't disoriented. He wanted to die. Believing that his setting off the explosion was a one-time occurrence, the courts took a humane approach. Under a doctor's care, Bruno Vitelli pleaded guilty to three charges of arson and received three years probation. His daughter, Sonia, was found innocent of the murder charges against her. Bruno Vitelli was a man who thought his choices were between life and death, but he ended up in a living hell. A man is found dead in the trunk of a car. A garage has been carefully cleaned to wipe away every trace of blood. No one is telling officers anything. Can police identify the murderer from a footprint inside an abandoned pair of boots? Enter the world of forensic science, the science of crime, where a suspect's guilt or innocence can hang on a single piece of evidence. Every heart has secrets it hides from the world. Secrets of love, secrets of hate, secrets of blood. A killer can hide his motive, can hide his murder weapon, but he can't wipe away every mark of his presence. No matter how lightly he steps on the earth, the secret of his passing is still there. Vatslav Porchev is a recent immigrant from Eastern Europe. He lives in Ottawa with his Canadian wife, Deirdre. They have borders, two fellow immigrants from his home country. But in Vatslev Porchev's home, there is no doubt about who's boss. February 1996. It's a bitterly cold afternoon in Ottawa. 
In a shopping mall parking lot, police are called to examine what appears to be an abandoned car, possibly stolen. Police found a, a white uh, male uh, with uh, black hair lying on his left side. His left arm was underneath his body, and his right arm was folded over top of his chest. His legs were uh, bent at the knee, and we could see that he had only sock feet. We saw a bunch of debris in the trunk of the car, uh, paint flakes and sand and that sort of thing. Police find no fingerprints on the car. The name on the registration papers is Vetslav Porchev. His wife had reported him missing just that morning. When was he killed? How and where? Detective Randy Whisker of the Ottawa Police Homicide Squad will lead the autopsy report on the cause and time of death. The first 24 hours is critical in any investigation. And in this particular situation, we were already more than 24 hours behind. While waiting for the autopsy report, police bring Deirdre Porchev down to the station to break the news of her husband's murder. Accompanying her is Pavel Klimka, one of the boarders who shared her house. In view of the fact that she had initially seemed quite concerned that her husband had been missing, when uh, informed of his death, her reaction was somewhat deadpan. She didn't show any extreme signs of grief or shock, and she acted basically quite normal. Pavel Klimka, on the other hand, appears concerned at the news of Porchev's death. He is offering comfort where none seems to be wanted. No one is reacting the way police expect. It's very odd, not at all like the simple brutality of Porchev's death described by pathologist Dr. Verbala Acharya. Based on my examination, it seemed that there were at least seven blows to the head. That's the minimum I counted. And they were mostly on the top uh, and the back and the side of the head. Most of these blows were uh, severe enough, but uh, there was one blow to the back of the head which had caused uh, a depressed fracture of the underlying skull with uh, involvement of the brain, which could have been a very severe blow, which would have uh, caused death in this uh, person. There were no defense wounds on the hands. Investigators drive out to the Porchev home to look around and to meet the second border. But before they even get inside, a piece of evidence recovered from the body is about to pay off. For all intents and purposes, it appeared to be just another suburban home. But as we approached the home and were walking up the laneway, we paid particular attention to the lip of the garage floor. Because when Mr. Porchev was found in the trunk of the car, he didn't have any shoes on, and his socks showed flecks of gray paint. We could see that the floor of the garage had been painted with gray paint, and that was starting to flake. The interior of the house is unremarkable. It seems the only remarkable thing is the second border, Dmitry Dimitrov. Mr. Dimitrov was somewhat odd. He had a shaggy beard. His hair was uncombed and disheveled looking in general. But investigators soon discover that the unkempt Dimitrov is by no means the only curious thing about the Porchev house. When I opened the garage door, it was cleaner than any garage I had ever seen. And there was a peculiar odor which appeared to me to be of a chemical or cleaning agent. When he also sees faint reddish spots on the floor, Whisker immediately seals the house and calls in identification officer Scott Brown. Now at this stage, we weren't certain where the victim had been killed. Uh, we certainly didn't think it was in the trunk of the car, but we didn't have a scene clearly identified either. So with um, those two indications, this small reddish stains and the smell of a cleaner, um, we let, that led us to the garage as a potential scene for the homicide. It was shocking that there was, there was such an apparent lack of evidence, so it, it became obvious to us that there must have been a cleanup attempt. 
In uh, processing the scene as a blood scene analyst, the first step is to make observations of the scene using just a strong, bright white light. On the wall surface uh, leading into the house uh, in the garage, we had seen some white marks, and we were quite certain that uh, some type of a cleanup effort had been made there. Brown uses a solution called luminol, which glows in a darkened room when it comes into contact with traces of blood. And in fact, we got positive results. We got a uh, sustained bluish green glow on the wall surface uh, beside the stairs leading into the house. Brown also notices tracks along the floor where something, perhaps a body with stocking feet, had been dragged. Luminol sprayed along the tracks reveals a trail of blood leading from the garage steps, leaving distinct traces on everything it touched. And it led us to believe that a blood source had moved along that path area or along the one side of the garage. Whoever killed Vatslev Porchev had met him suddenly and violently on the stairs between the garage and the house. And someone had taken an unusual amount of care to wipe away any trace of the crime. Police now need to find out who and why. It's natural for a killer to try to hide his tracks. No fingerprints are found in the garage. The cleanup was thorough, but not thorough enough. Scott Brown finds a murderous story written in blood spatters on the side of the steps up against the garage wall the one place the fastidious killer had missed. All I did in this case was um, to take a piece of plastic and lay it over the stairs and um, draw lines through each individual stain. And as you can see, the uh, stains begin to crisscross in this area, which we call an area of convergence. I can say with certainty because of the crisscrossing of these lines above the stair that a, a blow was struck to a blood source about three or four inches above the top of the stair surface. So now it is clear where Porchev was killed. But it is the extreme thoroughness of the cleanup that still intrigues investigators. Why would an intruder bother to clean up if it had been, a, let's say, a foiled break and enter attempt or a foiled robbery or something? Well, the intruder would have just left without bothering to clean up or conceal uh, the scene. Sit down! In another situation where you have a victim found murdered and abandoned in the trunk of his car some miles from the home. Your list of suspects could be endless. But now with the physical evidence pointing back directly to the house, it really gave us an opportunity to focus on the occupants of the house. So who in the house could have a reason for wanting Václav Porchev dead? If the killing is an inside job, then who among the three housemates has a motive for murder? It doesn't take the investigators long to answer that question. Everyone in the house has a possible reason for wanting Václav Porchev dead. Get your hands off of me. First is his wife, Deirdre Porchev, a woman scorned and humiliated by her husband. Disgusting, you make me sick. Look at, look at, look at this hair. The relationship between her and her husband was almost to the point of non-existent. He was um, verbally rude to her in front of other people. On occasion, he had physically abused her. I think he thinks that don't exist. I am your wife! Then there is Dmitry Dimitrov, an unemployed engineer and eccentric loner. Porchev treated him with contempt. You stink like a pig. In turn, Dimitrov despised Porchev and was angered by his treatment of Deirdre. And lastly, Pavel Klimka, a small man with a big temper. That's enough. You get away from me. You fuck off. Stop it. Look. Mr. Klimka had arrived some five or six months prior to the murder. His wife, who he was estranged from, was also living in Ottawa. Oh, 
Soon after his separation, Klimka began to suspect Porchev was having an affair with his estranged wife. Mr. Klemka had concerns about the fact that Mr. Porchev was spending quite a bit of time with her, as was Mrs. Porchev, who affectionately referred to her as the bitch. Everyone had a reason to hate Porchev, but who had the opportunity to kill him? Until police know the time of death, they cannot eliminate anyone in the house. Porchev worked the night shift at a nearby factory. He was a man of habit. His routine never varied. His routine was so specific that uh, we knew he had left work as usual, and we knew when he got home that he was only five or 10 minutes drive from his workplace. He'd drop his knapsack and thermos in the hall, take his work boots off at the door, get cleaned up, go to bed. The same thing day in, day out. And that was significant to us as well in terms of narrowing down the time frame of the murder because his knapsack and thermos were found in the car. So we knew that he hadn't even had an opportunity when he got home to get inside the door. Police assumed he came home at the usual time. They placed the time of death at between 7 and 7.30 a.m. But what if the killer put the knapsack and the thermos back in the car, attempting to hide the fact that Porchev even got home? Investigators begin to collect alibis. Deirdre says she was up and on her way to work as usual, more than an hour before her husband was due to arrive home. Both boarders admit that they were home when the murder must have taken place. Dimitrov says he was awakened by a loud thump early in the morning. He then went straight back to sleep and didn't get up until 10.30. Later, Klimka told Dimitrov that the loud thump was him tripping over the cat. Klimka tells police he didn't notice anything wrong. He went to his English class that morning as usual at 8.30 and then worked until late in the evening. Investigators take note of the fact that Porchev's body is found only blocks from Klimka's language school. To check out their suspicions, they decide to have a few more words with Mr. Klimka. He tells them he has no idea how the body ended up near his school. He also denies having any conflict with Porchev over his estranged wife. Police know Klimka has a criminal record in his home country and that he's been jailed twice. He denies it, claiming he was pardoned. The stories Klimka tells police don't add up. It's clear that both boarders had opportunity and motive to commit the murder, and investigators believe that both men are telling tales. Two days after the discovery of the body, Dmitry Dimitrov and Pavel Klimka are arrested for the murder of Vatslav Porchev. But police don't believe they have enough proof yet to convict the two men. The IDENT team turns their attention from the garage to the inside of the house, scouring it for more evidence. As we worked through, uh, we uh, came across some personal information and, and documentation and so on, but nothing of any real value to tie any of the occupants to the house to what had happened in the garage. It wasn't until we got right down to the front door and were nearly finished in the house that Jeff found a pair of winter boots in the front hall closet. And when he pulled them out to examine them, he noticed some reddish staining on the back of one of the boots. The reddish stains proved to be blood, but whose? If the blood matches Porchev's, then the boots themselves might be a silent witness to his murder. The uh, boots were tested and came back with a 1 in 170 billion probability DNA matching the victim. The tests confirm beyond doubt that the blood is Porchev's. To Randy Whisker, the blood stain tells a violent story. Not only were they simply blood stains, but as our blood spatter expert was able to tell us later on, they had come upon the boots with velocity. That is, it wasn't just passive dripping or staining, but those boots had to have been present 
when the killing took place. Dimitrov and Klimka both deny owning the boots. Deirdre claims ignorance. Is someone lying? Is everyone lying? Whose boots are they? And who was wearing them when they were splattered with Vatslev Porchev's blood? The Porchev household is a viper's nest of jealousies and hatreds. Detective Whisker finds out more about the tortured relationship between Deirdre and Vatslev Porchev. She was a Canadian citizen, he was an immigrant, and it was a means of being married to her to keep his status as a citizen in, in Canada. And that appeared to be the only real foundation for the relationship. So police decide to pay a little closer attention to Deirdre Porchev. Although her alibi checks out, police still suspect that Deirdre may have had a hand in the murder. They obtain a warrant and place wiretaps on her phone, looking for incriminating evidence. In April, two months after her husband's murder, Deirdre is arrested on suspicion of involvement in her husband's killing. So, now all three residents of the porch of home have been arrested. Investigators can't shake the feeling that they may be dealing with a conspiracy. One officer confides that no one was telling us anything, but suspicion, innuendo, and speculation aren't enough to convict anyone of murder. Now the blue boots spotted with Porch's blood are the only concrete link between the killer and the victim. Exhibit A, the print of a killer's foot inside a pair of boots. Since no one will admit to owning the boots, police will have to prove whose they are. Shoes belonging to both Klimka and Dimitrov are seized and sent to RCMP Sergeant Robert Kennedy, a barefoot impression specialist. We go to the weight-bearing areas, the darkened and indented areas of an insole, and we start comparing the shapes and placements of each toe uh, to determine if any of the suspect shoes could have made the impression there was only one uh, suspect shoe that matched the detail found on the uh, shoe from the crime scene. But how can Sergeant Kennedy be certain that only one person has worn these boots? What if the killer stepped into an innocent man's boots to commit his crime? What we look for is sharp edge detail. If we trace around each toe in this particular shoe, trace the metatarsal ridge, we can see that it's very sharp, it's not fuzzy at all. If somebody else had worn that shoe, then this sharp edge detail up here would be uh, fuzzy because the toe of the other person would start making the impression above it or below it, causing it to be fuzzy. It wouldn't be as sharp as, as it is. And in this particular case, there's no indication at all that anybody else uh, has, has worn the shoe. Kennedy's findings are clear. It could only be one person who both owned the boots and wore them during the killing, Dmitry Dimitrov. With the additional evidence of Mr. Kennedy showing that Mr. Dimitrov was the wearer of those boots, our case was now pretty strong on Mr. Dimitrov. And a neighbor provided some additional evidence which further implicated Dimitrov. A witness who lived nearby saw this man getting into a car belonging to Mr. Porchev, the same car that Mr. Porchev was ultimately found in the next day. But why Dmitry Dimitrov? Sometimes motive isn't as easy to determine as investigators would like. Perhaps Dimitrov's quiet exterior hit a man who was full of rage at the humiliation he and the others had suffered at the hands of Porchev. Of course, Dimitrov claims that he is innocent, that he is not the killer. But the jury cannot reconcile his story with the facts. On December 3rd, 1999, Dimitrov is found guilty of second degree murder and is sentenced to life in prison. Deirdre Porchev, 
although arrested, was never charged. Pavel Klimka had the charges against him dropped for lack of evidence. Dmitry Dimitrov was a quiet soul, but you can't know a man unless you walked a mile in his shoes. When it comes to knowing a killer, if the shoe fits, wear it. The stories on Exhibit A are based on true cases. The forensic scientists and investigators are the actual individuals who worked on the cases. The names of the victims are fictitious. The names of the guilty are real.